Welcome to the 46th round of the eBay Tech Talk. Um, today it is my honor to speak here to you about um, OpenShift. Um, my name is uh, Lutz Lange. I'm a solution architect with Red Hat. I'm working uh, for Red Hat now for 10 years. And um, my main focus in the last uh, four years was dealing with container technologies. You might wonder what the solution architect is. Um, at Red Hat, this is uh, something like a pre-sales consultant everywhere else. So I do explain our technology to customers and lately service providers and partners, mainly. So um, the title is uh, OpenShift Container Platform and Enterprise uh, Kubernetes++. Plus Plus. Um, and um, I want to give you an overview and we can uh, have a bit of time uh, to discuss things as well. Um, the crowd is not too big to um, ask questions and get answers. So who here knows what this is or has something like this uh, at their company? Uh, raise your hand. <laughs> well, um, for me at least, we talk a lot uh, to, to bigger customers and, and partners and the bigger a company is, the more um, pronounced this problem gets because it is based on organizational issues first. So there is uh, someone that develops something and throws it when it's done into production and somebody else has to care about that and this leads to a lot of problems and long, long release cycles and, and debugging issues. There is a wall of confusion because um, the dev doesn't know what, what uh, in is needed in production and um, ops doesn't know what really to do with what they got. So um, sometimes this involves repackaging software and, and stuff like that. Um, the first step to really make a difference here and make this better is um, break down this wall of confusion. This is um, basically what DevOps aims at and um, it's the first step in a journey to, to make this better. Um, it's um, a reorganization mainly to put the people in, in the same team and make them more effective because they know what the other uh, person's job is, what their requirements is, and they start to care even. So um, you might have heard the term cloud native and digital transformation. I don't want to dwell too much on it, but um, what I want to talk about from technical side here fits right into the scheme. So reorg, we talked about this a bit, breaking down the compartments and the walls. You might have heard of Conway's law. It's, it's the first step, but um, then you find out that uh, a simple reorg is oftentimes not enough. You want to be quicker providing resources, so something like uh, self-service um, offering um, where you can get on-demand resources, um, automatic infrastructure as code thing might be needed and helpful. And I don't talk about the technologies. Um, there's lots of different technologies you can use for that, but that's uh, basically the same concept that you'll find in all of the cloud technologies. Um, then from an infrastructure side and me maybe even from a developer side, um, there's a need for automation, right? Um, you have um, seen things like Puppet and Chef and, and Ansible and uh, Nowadays, even Kubernetes um, fits into this space. Okay, um, so it's orchestration needs and it's IT automation that is at the center of all of it, um, has been for 20 years and more. Uh, and there's not a golden way to do this because um, every company, every process is different. So, um, but we're still improving on it. Um, CICD and continuous deployment are terms that uh, are often used uh, with the software development. Um, maybe can I get a, a show of hands here? Who has a developer background in the audience? Okay, so rather big number. Who has a more ops uh, view? Who would say he's DevOps? 
<laughs> okay, thank you. So there's uh, more developers here, and uh, we could uh, later steer the discussion uh, and, and what I'm showing more into this direction. My my background is more from from the infrastructure side. That's uh, where I come from. Um, but uh, these concerns nowadays uh, they mix, as we've seen in the, in the terms. Uh, of um, DevOps. So CI, CD pipelines are not only something for software development anymore, these things come to um, running software and to the ops department as well. And then there's advanced deployment techniques. That's where you have sit, uh, have had a long sit down with everybody, and uh, your your processes uh, uh, start to run smoothly, and uh, you, you're quite happy with what with what you're doing, right? Um, yeah, and then there's um, the. <laughs> this is where you want to get uh, with using microservices and all the, the latest stuff. So this is kind of a journey that you can um, can embark on, and everybody is uh, somewhere else in a journey. I have later on another picture that um, that you can use to discuss this. Um, but this is a slide. This uh, has a few questions on it um, that make you think that. Uh, Spell it out again. What uh, we find lots of times when we talk with uh, bigger organizations. So, um, good question. How many days, or how long, do you have to wait uh, wait for resources for a VM? So, remember, VMs were supposed to make the whole wait for resources situation better. And yeah, they help. You don't have to wait like two or three months for resources. Now it's down to weeks most of the time. Because there's still a lot of stuff to do, like um, firewalling and the firewall department. They um, they don't have an API and didn't automate the stuff, so um, that's painful. And um, developers and not only developers, everyone uh, who is waiting for this ca cannot be productive in the meantime. There's ways around this. I've seen ways around this. Developers ordering tons and tons of virtual machines beforehand because they might need it. This is one solution, but it's maybe not the ideal solution. So um, we talked about self-service. It's something great to use, really, um, if it's there and if it works. Something in that is API-driven that you can program and you don't have a ticket and a manual process in the end uh, that somebody needs to do and to make this work. So infrastructure on demand is one of the steps that you take. And then there's um, another thing to think about. And um, there has been uh, different um, terms to, to think about this. Um, you might have heard of the, of the pets and cattle discussion. There is uh, something else, and it's the snowflakes and the phoenix discussion. So um, imagine every one of the snowflakes is a server or an instance um, where somebody has SSH'd into and run some script and change some configuration. This is Snowflakes, and this hurts you in the long run, um, and is, is not maintainable really. So what you what you want to get to is a state where you have phoenixes instead. Phoenixes are these um, beasts, these mythical creatures that um, can be burned down and they rise from their ashes. Ashes. So this is what you need to design for if you want to be quick and if you want to be able to scale really. So how you do this, I really don't care so much, but uh, it's it's a feature of um, the stuff that you have built. Now we're coming closer to what I really want to talk about. This was more of stage setting, what I did just now. So there's a term on here, Docker, that probably everyone knows in the room by now. Um, who here has played hands-on with Docker? Okay, so that's good. Um, I don't have to spend too much time on this, but mainly it's the packaging of the um, application together with the libraries as an immutable bundle. And this um, applies to the Phoenix concept, of course which makes it then easier to roll out all the um, applications and not worry too much about um, dependency issues with the libraries and such. So um, what we use on uh, for this uh, as Red Hat is obviously RHEL, and uh, there is a lot of uh, different technologies available that um, 
are used to make this more secure, like uh, SE Linux and uh, SVIRT uh, to uh, protect the resources, there's kernel namespaces, because these are all just processes, right, run on a Linux kernel. And there's the control groups to reduce the noisy neighbor phenomenon. Why are we doing container? There's another reason, and that is speed. This is just technical speed. So think about uh, the max that the different technologies can do, like a uh, physical server, you can get that up and running maybe in under a day, if you could, if you have the server already. Need to ramp it into the rack and so on. A virtual machine is uh, technology-wise, um, it could be quick, um, but in terms of speed, a container is really um, a story changer because uh, it can spin up in the time that a request is started. And uh, Google is um, mainly the main user of containers or has been the main user of containers for long years um, with their own tooling. And um, they start for everything that you do, they start a container just for you which is um, quite efficient as well. Why am I talking about Google? Um, I'm talking about Google because um, they decided like three and a half years back now that um, what they were doing with containers was so worthwhile, other people should do this as well. Um, and this they decided to open source the concepts that they have been using. They have um, an internal system is called Borg to manage their containers at scale and um, came up with the idea to um, start this Kubernetes project to um, rebuild that. So take all the experience that they gathered, put that into Kubernetes, start from scratch, make Kubernetes the better Borg. Because like every technology that has evolved over a long time of years, um, there are some quirks in Borgs uh, that they wanted to uh, get better with Kubernetes. Um, this fell um, into the same time frame that Docker came around, actually. And um, we as Red Hat decided uh, that we should put our platform as a service technology at the time, which was OpenShift version 2, onto a new technolo technological footing, which means we used Kubernetes from the start built that in and Docker to um, renew what we already had. So this is an orchestration engine, which means it does all this, what usually the ops guys do manually or start scripting themselves, right? And it has very far evolved now, and I uh, would say, and a lot of people would now agree, that it has won the orchestration wars, if you might call it that. Um, there's different technologies available, Docker Swarm, you might have heard of that, um, Mesos um, was another one, um, but uh, n no other technology has uh, gotten that speed in, in development and uh, new features and, and this this big crowd around it. So what is OpenShift then? So OpenShift is uh, a Docker runtime, it's a Kubernetes orchestration, and lots of stuff more that make this easy to use. Kubernetes is just an open source um, project, right? You can start and build a Kubernetes cluster same way as you can start and build your own Linux. It's possible to do that. There's Linux from scratch, which is a lot of guidance how to do this, but it's a lot of work. So what we set down to was making this easier to uh, consume. And this slide is um, just to show you what the difference is and what we add. I could spend like 15-20 uh, minutes on this slide and talk about the different features and what they do. Just to give you an impression there is lots of different choices that we make, choices that you would need to find solutions yourself if you start building your own Kubernetes cluster and put your processes on top. For networking, storage, for um, how to deal with logs, how to deal with um, metrics and stuff, um, security things, then how can I integrate that with my developer uh, workflows. There's things that we have built and we can spend time on this. Um, I have a few other slides I would like to go through to give you basic um, 
understanding of uh, what we can do and what this is and how it's built up. Um, and then we can come maybe back to this or dive into uh, different areas that are of interest to you here and today. This is another view um, for the journey that you can take uh, in the different departments, in the different um, uh, yeah, lines, uh, if you will. There's uh, applications you can look at and um, the architecture of applications has changed um, a bit, at least if you write new applications, because the old ones are still lying around, of course. Um, so um, somebody said uh, writing monoliths is, uh, is a bad idea, let's structure that a bit better and there's N-tier applications now where you have your front end, your middleware and your back end and the en vogue term now is microservices, yay, everybody's doing microservices now, who here is doing microservices? Quite a lot of you, good. Um, of course, you have the developer background, right? You're writing this stuff now, but um, if you look at the applications that are out there, 80% or 90% are not microservices today. Um, and these want to be run and hosted as well. So there's the infrastructure side of things, uh, from the data center to uh, something that is hosted and then maybe hybrid architectures. I get a lot of questions about uh, hybrid architectures or cloud, cloud native, cloud only architectures um, nowadays. Uh, development processes uh, need to align with uh, with that as well to be uh, speedy, so smaller teams, agile um, development, DevOps processes, um, you run it, you own it, things things like that. And this is a good slide to discuss uh, this uh, with, with companies that you sit down uh, to where are you um, in the different areas and then you can, can address concerns and start to dig deeper. But containers themselves do mean different things to different audiences. So um, there is uh, the sysadmin and ops part, and for them it's uh, sandboxed applications, it's um, denser packing, it's um, better resource usage and uh, portability even. For developers, they it's not just so much um, really a development tool, because containers don't have uh, so much to do with the code that they write, that's a packaging tool. It's something that makes it easier to deploy the stuff, to be quicker with that, to um, not wait on resources too long. And uh, it's a technology that uh, is capable of being run in different infrastructures as well, right? Because um, it's a container, it makes it more portable and, and, and scalable. Um, I want to now uh, go a bit uh, deeper into, into OpenShift and talk about uh, how OpenShift is built up and which sections uh, of this uh, OpenShift uh, does address. So uh, we have seen self-service is a good idea and we do have a self-service capability. There's an API that we offer in OpenShift. It's um, based on Kubernetes, it's extended um, with a few features and there is a web UI that you can uh, use to access this. And um, I have a demo environment available I can show you some things. It's uh, multi-language. We don't have a focus on a specific um, programming language. There is um, a, a bunch of things that we integrate very well with because um, we offer builder images for it. So a way to easily build um, container images for certain uh, languages. Automation is at, at the center of all of this, of course. Um, this is the Kubernetes orchestration features and we have added on top of that as well to make it easier for you to um, deploy applications and roll back changes and roll out something that you had before. It makes it easier to collaborate if you have such a such a platform. Security is at the very heart of all of what we are doing here. If you go out to Docker Hub today and you grab an image and you run it, most of the time this runs as root. Is this something you want to do in production? Maybe not. And we do not allow that from um, the default setting. You can do this, but it's a cluster-wide setting you have to change, or not a cluster-wide, but a setting you have to change. Um, it's hardened, there's a life cycle behind this, and we update this and we have, have an upgrade path. Who here has uh, run a Kubernetes cluster? Okay, a few of you. Um, updates is still something that is um, a bit problematic, what I've heard. Um, so this is something that we design in. You can upgrade um, your OpenShift from my one minor version to the next. 
Um, web scale, obviously, standards based. Standards based is actually a very um, important topic as well. Um, who here knows what the OCI is? The Open Container Initiative. There has been a lot of discussion like two years back when um, CoreOS uh, launched uh, Rocket. And uh, there was a fear that uh, we get into a situation like with the Unisys uh, that were um, splintered off in different directions, not compatible anymore. And um, who would have benefited from uh, these competing standards, right? Uh, they needed to be put into uh, these competing systems because the standard is some, yeah. Don't get me uh, started on talking on standards too much. But uh, we now have an OCI version 1.0 um, that is an industry standard. So um, there is in what the runtime has to offer, what the image has to look like, and, and things like that, uh, which um, makes it uh, a more secure environment to invest into, really. So. Um, there's different levels that we can look at. So um, at the uh, most um, at, um, down level, there is uh, the the host, right? This is still a Linux. This is for us um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, of course. And there's different um, options or variants. You can use an atomic host, which is a specialized version of RHEL that is um, stripped down to only allow running containers. Or you can use a full Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, and it depends what you're used to. Most people uh, and most customers that we have go for the full Red Hat Enterprise Linux variant nowadays. But we imagine that when the clusters uh, grow bigger and bigger, this uh, can lead to problems because this is not immutable infrastructure. While uh, the Atomic host can be uh, run as immutable infrastructure for the host, which uh, ties down changes and uh, allows for better management and scalability. There's the container runtime and packaging, which is uh, uh, Docker. And yeah, we put something on top. And that's the infrastructure level here. Um, at the heart of it is the Kubernetes. Um, the current version of OpenShift is version 3.6. And the .6 aligns with Kubernetes 1.6, which is the basis uh, that is uh, in uh, the 3.6 version. Um, so we lag a bit behind, but it's uh, only four to six weeks um, until we have the newest version in nowadays. And then there's networking. We have a certain, uh, we have one default networking, SDN networking built in. Uh, there is choices for networking that we can talk about and have a slide later on. There is choices for storage that are supported uh, here and are available. Um, this is um, the storage mainly that I'm talking about that you um, provide for your workloads, for your pods. So persistent central storage. There's a registry already. Regi you need something to put your images. Um, so OpenShift comes with a default registry, with a secured registry, um, and you can only access that if you have a token, and a token you can only get if you authenticate it. There are solutions for uh, logs and metrics as well. So in a containerized environment, um, how do you get to the logs of your workloads? Something you need to find a solution for, and we have one in. Uh, it's an Elasticsearch Fluentd Kibana combination that we are using that um, runs fluently on the host, that gets all the log messages from that host. You have to build your workloads uh, in a way that uh, they put out every log message onto standard out when they run. Um, and then sends that off to uh, Elasticsearch and you can use a Kibana interface to look at that. There is a metrics solution as well. Metrics is um, where you look at counters, like uh, how much CPU, how much memory have I used, um, what's um, with the uh, network uh, bandwidth that is used, things like that. Um, it's uh, also important for different reasons, like um, if you want to um, bill a customer for using this environment one reason, right? Or just uh, debugging uh, things uh, might be interesting as well. There's a Horkula Cassandra um, heapster combination uh, stack that we have uh, for this. 
And then there's security stuff. We have a role-based access uh, control mechanism. Uh, you can really tie all of this down. There is um, quotas that you can put onto projects. Projects are used to organize all the objects in, in the cluster. Users get access to these projects. The projects can have a quota and if I want to really use it, then I need to bound or uh, limit my workloads uh, so that they can only use certain amounts of resources. This is under the hood then um, implemented with C groups. And uh, so that's what you can do for um, resource management, for example. On top of that, we um, put tools that are um, addressing the cloud um, concerns that we had before uh, that are mostly found in, in the developer space and for a long while we uh, positioned this um, as a solution that addresses developers first. Now it's um, for developers and for production uh, workloads. So there's the self-service that I talked about, uh, there's a web UI and the API. There is a service catalog that is um, mainly a feature where you can uh, put in um, workloads that you can order from. So there is um, a template mechanism, for example, that um, allows you to uh, group all the objects that you need to uh, run a workload. And it can be a complex workload, a multi-container workload um, that needs um, services, um, routes, um, IP addresses, stuff uh, like that, um, configuration files, um, and can that, uh, that can then be ordered um, fr from the service catalog, from the API, or from the command line, um, or from the web UI. It's called templates. It's something that um, Kubernetes does not bring out of the box yet. And uh, we have revamped the service catalog even, and I can uh, spend more time on that later uh, if you want to. Uh, we just um, announced a, a tech preview feature in 3.6 um, that you can look at that makes uh, service, uh, services more powerful. Another thing you need to think about is where do I build my container images? And one option that you can go for is um, you can do it on OpenShift. You don't need to. Do it on OpenShift. If you have something already, you can continue to do that. Um, we do have something that's called source to image. I, uh, I do have a slide about that later. There's a deployment automation that I mentioned already. Um, so every time you uh, deploy an application, it gets uh, recorded what the configuration was. And you can then later on decide to roll out the version that you had before. It's always an ongoing deployment. so you can't re not really go back, but you can go back to a deployment version and the configuration that was before. We do have CICD uh, features in. This is mainly an integration into uh, things like Jenkins. So there is a Jenkins integration. Uh, you can run uh, with your company-wide um, Jenkins installation or you can run Jenkins in OpenShift. Um, and see what's going on in Jenkins in, in the OpenShift UI, for, for example. So this is um, a source to image walkthrough uh, slide, and uh, it's a specialty of OpenShift. It's something uh, that um, nobody else has, so far as I know, and uh, it looks like this. So there's a developer. The developer does what he does on his notebook and uh, at a certain point in time decides to commit code into Git. You do have a git somewhere and uh, you can configure the git with a webhook to inform OpenShift there is new code. So OpenShift gets informed there is new code and can then start, if it's configured that way, to um, get a builder image from the registry and schedule that builder image into the cluster. Builder image is started with a parameter that points to the uh, GitHub repository where the code is, pulls down the code, runs its magic, there are scripts in that can um, transform that source code into binary code and in the end add an additional layer on top of the builder image and commit that back to the registry. So if that is back, back in the registry and your deployment is uh, set to watch the image streams as we call it um, and has an image uh, change trigger 
then a new version of your application can be rolled out automatically. So your yeah, old application can be running and can then be replaced. And there's different strategies that you can use to replace that, which is um, quite nice to have for agile testing things. And um, so this is the, the stack, if you will. And on top of that, you can pu uh, put your own um, workloads and applications and containers. And we as Red Hat do that as well. So um, all of these are already on OpenShift and available on OpenShift. This is, for example, a mobile uh, platform. Feed Henry Base is the open source project uh, of that. was only available as a... Uh, a web-based, cloud-based service. We have made it available on-premise now, but you have to put it o on OpenShift. Yeah. So, with that, this is the architecture overview. Here's a lot of different boxes here. And uh, I will spend the next um, 10 to 15 minutes going through the different boxes and explaining what, what these do and how this works. Um, some of you here already know Kubernetes, so um, these concepts might um, seem familiar, and they are. So OpenShift runs anywhere. You can run a RHEL x86-64, because uh, that's uh, what we have tied the Docker support to. Docker support, be careful with that, because um, you have to use the Docker that we ship. There's different Docker versions. There's Docker from the company Docker, and uh, there was a project, a community project called Docker. Uh, it's not called that anymore. It's now called Mobi. Um, and uh, we do run the hardened community code. We do have a few patches in uh, that Docker wouldn't wouldn't accept, but were necessary for uh, for making this uh, work in a good way. Um, anyhow, you do have nodes. Nodes is where your workloads uh, run then. So uh, the applications that you want to run. Uh, and these run in things, that these are called pods. There's uh, specialized uh, containers uh, called pods in Kubernetes. And uh, you can run one or multiple containers inside one pod. The pod is the atomic scheduling unit. So this is what Kubernetes sends out to the different hosts and w watches then the, uh, the, the containers inside. And if one of the containers inside a pod dies, then it is rescheduled, for example. The pod is also that, that what gets an IP address. So um, if I want to run a container image, then um, the container image is put into that um, pulled onto the node, put into the pod context, uh, so into the container context and into the pod context, and it runs on the node. So I've said that already. We do have a few more icons here where you can see a Tomcat and a MongoD and other containers. There's a MySQL down there, whatever you want to run. There's a control, control plane involved as well. This is called master. There can be one or multiple masters. Masters well, the master controls the environment. There is a bit of overhead, of course. So the API um, service, API server, runs on the master. This is what everything talks to when it wants to do something in the cluster. We do have a command line utility. It's called OC. It's an extension of the kubectl, you might know. Um, the web UI talks um, to the API. And you can talk to the API directly with whatever tools you have. Um, then there's a data store. Um, everything in a Kubernetes-based environment and nowadays in cloud environments is uh, done with these uh, key value objects that are in JSON or YAML. Um, I found that um, in the beginning there was lots of more JSON. Now people do YAML. Um, it's better readable than JSON, human readable, I think. Though you have to be careful with the um, formatting, right? with the indentation. Um, that's an Etsy D that runs there. There's a registry. I mentioned that already. Registry is um, shown here as uh, standing on the side, but uh, really it's running on a node as well. You can run it on the master, run the master as a node. There's a node service that you can run there and put the registry in there if you want to. 
So it's uh, an architect choice where you put it, but you do have to run an internal registry. Um, there's a scheduler. The scheduler looks into the um, data store and uh, sees uh, the objects uh, that are there. And um, scheduler looks into the environment and tries to make a match. Um, so there's a policy behind um, um, as well that um, deals with issues like placement and so on and so forth. Um, but one of the core techniques is um, that uh, you specify what the world should look like or your environment should look like and Kubernetes will make sure that it gets to that state. So starts or stops workloads, for example, is one of these issues. Placement is uh, determined by a policy in it. Policy can look at labels, for example. So every object that you have can get a label. Um, this allows you to control where workloads are placed, for example. So um, this, you could run an OpenShift as a dedicated environment, meaning for, for just one user, or you can run it in a multi-tenant fashion where you have multiple users. And maybe you want to decide that a certain user, um, a certain user's workloads are only placed on these two nodes and nobody else goes there would be something that you can do by using labels in a clever way. Um, then there's health and scaling mechanisms available as well. So um, I said it's an orchestration mechanism and um, one thing that the um, IT department needs to make sure is that workloads keep running and um, if something fails they need to repair that. This has been um, a manual job in the past a lot with um, much of um, um, what's what's the word where you get a pager and are called in the night yeah so uh, we don't want to do that and uh, you as somebody that um, builds workloads that run in this environment and that know your workload what you can you can help here because uh, it's your task to define health checks only you can really know what uh, what the conditions is under that you would say your application is really healthy. And you can provide that information to the outside um, so that it can be checked. A simple um, web call could be enough that uh, returns success when everything is good and an error code if it's not. And then the environment calls, so the OpenShift uh, cluster calls these health checks in, uh, in, a, in a certain schedule. And if these fail, then the environment can take action, like restart that workload, migrate that workload, restart it somewhere else. And this is something that, the, um, that, that OpenShift does for you. So there's a service layer. Hmm. Service layer, what do I need that for? Um, the service layer um, is needed for um, the communication between different pods. So back in the beginning when it, uh, Docker was quite new, everybody said, well, wow, this is so uh, such, such a good technology. I can put uh, my application into the container and then I schedule it somewhere and everything's fine. And then uh, people started doing that and uh, suddenly they realized maybe I need more than one container. And that's where the problem started because uh, these need somehow maybe to talk to each other. Um, so there is um, a network in between, hopefully. What kind of network and how do they get the IP addresses? I can hard code that, but then it's not scalable anymore. Um, we do have uh, a networking in between here, uh, our uh, default SDN solution. Um, is it interesting to you? Okay. Um, so uh, this is, uh, in default it works like this. Um, the whole cluster gets an internal IP address range uh, of a B cluster, a B cluster of the B network, class B network. And uh, then the nodes get assigned a um, subset, a class C network. Every node gets a class C from that class B network. And when a pod is scheduled onto a node, it's 
um, assigned an IP address in a dynamic way. So um, it doesn't know beforehand which IP address it gets, but it gets one. So if I have uh, a Tomcat and a MongoD and these need to work together, then I need some kind of mechanism so that they can find each other. And we do have uh, something that is not on this slide here. It's a uh, DNS, a Sky DNS here. And uh, a service layer IP network. That's a class C network, I think, in the default, um, which can give out cluster-wide IP addresses, service IP addresses. I define, if I want to be reachable from other ports, I define a service object. The service object gets a name, like um, my Mongo, for example. And when I define that, I reserve a service layer IP address uh, with that my Mongo. So this gets then resolved from my Sky DNS if my uh, Tomcat wants to talk to my Mongo, it just opens uh, a connect connection to HTTPS, for example, my Mongo. This resolves to the service layer IP address, and the service layer IP address is reachable from every port through IP tables, DNet magic that happens. So um, this is what we do internally still not reachable from the outside. It's all internal. It's a security mechanism. There is persistent storage. Um, in the beginning uh, of OpenShift, um, on in the beginning of any cloud um, technologies, it was um, always that these are for stateless workloads, right? Something uh, which, which can die and restart and do doesn't need an, any storage. Um, nowadays, what we found there's lots and lots of applications that are different, that need storage, that are stateful. So we have a mechanism now to uh, provide central storage. Different storage technologies. We can talk about that uh, later later as well. The first one was, was NFS, but uh, we're past that. We can do other stuff now. So access from the outside. Access from the outside is done through uh, a routing layer, so another of these objects that go into the uh, etcd. Um, and it's implemented in a way that uh, when you set up your cluster, you delegate a uh, or you set up a wildcard DNS domain. Everything under appsexample.com um, is then pass on to your routers. There is a router component, component that you deploy and it's an HA proxy container that runs and is updated every time a new route object is um, created in the environment. And this then allows you access from the outside. You get an, a name, uh, an application name that you put into your browser, for example, and uh, this brings you to the routing layer and this then knows which service is meant and through this, no, yeah, okay. I don't want to make it too complicated, it's implemented a little bit different, but um, it goes uh, through the routing layer and the service layer and forms the routing layer which ports these endpoints have, okay. This is the basic overview of how OpenShift works. And then there's people that work with that. It can be developers with their source uh, control mechanism and the Git and their external pipeline and tools that use this as a platform to um, dynamically get resources they don't have to wait for. Um, or it can be operations, right, that uh, run production workloads in this. So I do have more slides, a few more slides um, to, to, to take uh, more look, uh, looks at the, um, at the infrastructure. I have uh, one slide here that uh, is uh, for the um, software-defined networking and there's different, different models available. Um, what I just talked about was the flat network option. In the flat network option, uh, every port could theoretically talk to every other port in the cluster. A uh, lot of customers don't want that. They say uh, it's not good um, and we need more separation. Um, there is the multi-tenant network option available for, for a while now and this allows for separation um, of projects. So each project gets uh, like uh, their own VLAN and is boxed in. 
and they can only reach the default namespace or the default project. There's a default project in OpenShift where central services run, like the internal registry, like the router, things like that, that needs to be accessible from, from all the projects. But um, your workloads don't, don't need to be accessible from every project. So in this um, diagram project C stands alone, you have the option of joining projects and make the different workloads available to each other in, in a project, but that's uh, what the multi-tenant network can do today. And you can basically use that in multi-tenant cluster situations uh, to um, separate the network traffic. Still, for some, this is not enough, um, especially um, security-sensitive um, industries like um, finance, for example. They um, want uh, something even more granular where they can then speci specify exactly which connections are allowed and everything else just doesn't work. Um, this is uh, in the making. Uh, it's uh, currently uh, marked as technology preview. Um, and uh, yeah, will come in in the next version probably. You can take a look at it today, but it's not really done yet. That's uh, every time we say technology preview, that's just uh, something that is still evolving. Um, and then there's people that say, well, I do already have an SDN. I don't want yours. Um, it's possible to do that as well. This is a list of uh, plugins that are certified or validated against OpenShift. This is not something that we as Red Hat support. We just support the um, the API for it uh, until the other software vendor gets in and um, they then uh, use their technology um, as well. So Flannel is not really a good option. This is something that you can use with in combination with OpenStack because you get double encapsulation in that. Nuage, um, Tigera, you can read it yourself. Um, th there is options. Um, another thing, I have one slide in my main deck here uh, is uh, persistent storage. Persistent storage is an important part of uh, applications, uh, especially uh, if you want to use this platform to run um, stateful workloads, workloads that run longer than just a few days or um, longer than just for testing. And the platform is uh, is destined to do that. And there is uh, NFS, it's we started out with NFS, there's ClusterFS, um, which is uh, software-defined networking and um, also the uh, basis for our container-native storage. I can talk about that a little bit more if you're interested then. Uh, this is running cluster inside of OpenShift um, as well. Um, then there is storage that is uh, dependent on the architecture that you deploy OpenShift on, like um, OpenStack Cinder. You have to deploy on. Um, you have to deploy on um, OpenStack for that, or AWS EBS, uh, the uh, Google Compute uh, Persistent Disk, um, Azure Disk, Azure File. Um, there is Ceph. But only the Rados block device currently. There is technology wise a Ceph file system that's not done yet. So we're not confident enough to say this is uh, a technology that uh, you can reliably put your data on. Uh, this takes a while longer. Um, iSCSI, you could do fiber channel. I'm not so sure if fiber channel is the best option for this. It's not so flexible in my experience. Uh, it needs a good API then. Because um, the way you use the storage needs to be um, in a self-service way. Really. And if you looked at uh, the development of uh, the persistent storage options in, in the last uh, two, two years, uh, in the beginning um, an administrator had to chop up bits of storage and create physical volumes and make these available in abundance in the cluster to be used from, to be chosen from when needed, um, which was really a bad choice because you can't match uh, your your requirements very in a very good way. So maybe you have 10 gig uh, volumes, lots of 10 gig volumes available and then comes a claim for like one gig and yay, I found Kubernetes or OpenShift found a match and uses uh, this volume and you have lots of wasted storage that you don't uh, really request it. There is a mechanism now that's called uh, dynamic storage provisioning and this fixes this. 
So there is a physical volume claim object that somebody who uh, needs storage would write to request storage. And uh, there is uh, with um, cluster open stack cinder AWS these and these, I think at least, um, there is a way that uh, a volume can be created on the fly in the right size with the right specification. No, it is. Yeah, it's storage. And there is lots and lots of reference architectures that we have. So, in terms of um, of, of products that we have, emerging products as we call it, um, OpenShift is uh, the most successful one. Um, and I think there was were lots of of technology hypes in the past uh, few years, um, and it for quite a few of them turn out that it took quite a long while to uh, get to a state where it's really usable and uh, more companies and people use that. Um, OpenShift Kubernetes is on a fast track. It uh, has surprised me how, how quick uh, adoption of this is. Yeah, and so we came up with uh, lots of different um, reference architectures. This is where um, our engineers uh, sat down and, and, and wrote, wrote a guide, a best practice, to how to deploy on or do OpenShift on, on a certain infrastructure. These are all links and you will get the uh, slides uh, afterwards. This was my main slide deck. And uh, we do now enter the um, discussion section of uh, the evening. I have more slides. Or I can do a quick demo if uh, you're interested. De I see nodding heads with a demo. And we try that. Not sure if that works. I didn't test this screen setting before. Something works. Okay. Good. So, um, this font is too small. Let's change that. <laughs> no. Let's not change that. Um, so this is um, a cluster. I can show a bit of the infrastructure as well that I'm using here. So um, I do have this running on the Google Compute Cloud. There's different options to run OpenShift. You can even run it on a notebook, and I can talk about that a little bit. It's quite easy to do for uh, for, for testing purposes. Um, for, for these kinds of demos, um, it's m sometimes uh, interesting to, to see more complicated stuff and, and how this works. So I um, have an installation that um, runs uh, on the Google Cloud Platform, and uh, for talks like this, I, I spin that up. So there is one master and three nodes in, in my setting here. There's some kind of bastion host uh, that I put up as well. Um, for a production environment, um, we do recommend um, a fair amount of, of resources um, just to make, make sure that, that it runs smoothly. And uh, if you decide to deploy the logging stack or the metric stack that I talked about, please do reserve uh, special nodes for that because this needs uh, some uh, juice to, to really work. Um, in my case, uh, I decided to go for 8 vCPUs and 30 gigs of uh, RAM for the master. Um, and uh, I did uh, design the nodes a bit smaller. Um, these are two vCPUs and uh, 7.5 gigs of memory nodes. Um, there is uh, the part with the uh, DNS uh, that I can quickly show you um, regarding network. There's a cloud DNS. So what I did is um, I... Um, transferred a uh, domain that I have into uh, the Google Cloud. This is a bit too small, isn't it? And uh, you can see it here. I do have, uh, for example, here the wildcard domain. Star apps OSE as a demo.de. And this points to the um, fixed IP address that I have on the master. I run in this 
set up in this architecture my router on the master might not be the best way to do it because if your master goes down all the applications can't be reached and I only have one router for an HA deployment you might need two at least um, but HA design is something that you can choose to do as well so um, I already connected to um, the web interface. This is the uh, web UI of the 3.6 uh, OpenShift. Um, this is mainly the user view. As a new user, um, you get um, shown this rather empty screen and you can say create project. Projects are um, extended namespaces. So in uh, Kubernetes you have these namespaces and we put a bit of stuff on top and called it project. And um, I call that eBay test, maybe, and uh, ah, only small letters, yeah, I keep forgetting that. eBay test, and I uh, call that um, eBay tech talk. So, and then I hit create. So, now I am uh, sent to the, I call it legacy um, service catalog. We do have a new one, and um, if we're lucky, I can sh I can show you the new one as well. Um, so this is where we have uh, the the templates um, shown that are available, and I can choose from these. There's languages. Languages is the source to uh, image builders that I mentioned already, and I could uh, quickly uh, select one um, and, and do a quick example, like um, the Ruby one. So um, I do now get all the um, the templates that are, are connected with anything with Ruby. There is the Ruby uh, S2I builder um, in the in the corner here, and then uh, there's a Ruby with a Postgres with a persistent Postgres. So I need a persistent volume on that, and there's an ephemeral version as well. I just go with the with the Ruby. There might be different versions available. This is all done in, in image streams um, in the background and handled in image streams. I select this and uh, so this is a test Ruby. You see I have tested it before, if it really works. And you give, besides the name, you give it um, a GitHub URL where there's source code. And we do have some samples provided um, and the sample is uh, quite enough. Uh, for, for us here. There's advanced options that you could do, but I just hit create. So if I hit create, um, I do get displayed um, a bit of information what I can do as well. So to manage uh, the OpenShift workload in um, from, from your notebook maybe, or from any station, from the command line, you could install the OC client. It's something you can run on your notebook and manage a far away cluster. All you need is uh, access to the um, API port. And the other thing is about the how to um, configure the webhook trigger if you want to uh, do stuff uh, automated, in an automated way. Let's go to the overview side. Um, this is the overview and all workloads are um, now shown in, in, in just one line and I can open that to see more details about it. Um, we do enhance the uh, web UI uh, with each minor release and, and do um, Amazing things, really. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised each and every time. Um, so now what we can do is we can, uh, in this overview, if I expand that, see the uh, logs of the build. So the builder image was scheduled into the cluster, has um, downloaded uh, the source code and is now compiling the, the Ruby stuff. What we have also uh, gotten is, uh, we see it on the top here, uh, a route. There's a route obje object. Oh, there's the clicker. So um, this route um, now is called test ruby minus eBay test at apps OSE SADMODE. You see what happened here. The uh, uh, the name of the uh, app is uh, comprised of the of the app name and the project name put together. That's that's the default. And once this is done, the build is done, and it's in the last stages here where it's uh, pushing the image layers after successful compile into the internal registry. Then uh, the image is scheduled into, into the cluster and run. The application is really run. And I can then uh, click on the route to um, access uh, the application. So this is what's happened now. So uh, the rolling deployment is pending. 
rolling deployment would mean that um, running uh, workloads would be exchanged uh, if something else would be running. And what I can do, what uh, else I can do here is uh, increase the number of copies, for example, just by pushing up these uh, arrows and buttons. This is uh, information about how much memory, uh, CPU cores, and, and so on uh, is used. I don't have that yet. The my um, metric stack needs to um, um, watch this for a while, and, and I want to display something. But we can go to the part, which is uh, interesting as well, because this is your workload, and this is um, where you might want to do uh, debugging and things. So uh, I said I have three nodes. Uh, what I see here now is w it runs on uh, OSE node 1, on the first node, um, and that's the IP address. Um, it's ready. Restart count is low. It's something to watch for, because uh, if something is wrong, the, res uh, the environment would uh, start restarting the workload in longer and longer time frames uh, if things can't be fixed. So um, if you watch the restart count, you see there was something wrong or there is something wrong and I need to do something. There's actually events that you can, can now watch uh, in this environment as well. This is the image that we're running. This is the build. Mm, there is a security uh, token that is mounted uh, into, into the pond context as well. Um, these are uh, only transferred in an encrypted way. Um, never reside on nodes, for example. There is uh, things like the environment. This allows you to uh, specify um, like environment uh, variables or um, config sets uh, which can be used to configure the applications that are running in the container. This is immutable infrastructure, right? So the container gets built, container is never changed, uh, but somehow you want to change settings and this is done um, through these environments. Um, for metrics, I don't have the information yet, but uh, this shows me that the metric stack is up and running. We can go uh, back there later. These are the logs um, on the standard output from, uh, from, from my workload. Not much done yet. Um, another thing which is quite uh, helpful from times, uh, time to time is uh, the terminal. You do get a terminal here into your running container workload. There's an additional bash process that is uh, started in the container context. Um, I could do stuff like uh, look at the Red Hat release as a 7.4 based. And then there is the, the events that you can, can watch if you want to know what's, what's happening in your environment. Um, pulling uh, is the Docker image. You can see how uh, images are, are specified. There is an SHA-256 uh, sum that uh, uniquely identifies each of these uh, images. Okay. Um, let's uh, access the uh, workload, maybe. That's an idea. It's not that. Uh, fancy, really, but this is what was built. I could have chosen another repository or another application. Mm. We do see now that uh, there is memory usage and uh, CPU cores and stuff, uh, information about that uh, coming along. What else is interesting? Maybe um, there's uh, other things that you could uh, choose to do, like deploy um, an image. If you have an image, you can run that image on OpenShift, provided it is OpenShift, built for OpenShift. So uh, there is no user statement in your Docker file and uh, stuff can run um, as non-root. Otherwise, you have to change your settings here. Um, all of this can be done on the command line with the EOC tool. Yeah. Okay, I can I can repeat that as uh, as well. So the question was uh, if uh, there would be something available um, for um, having an OpenShift playground starting um, without setting this up yourself uh, much. There's different options. So um, there's some things it you can do on your notebook. Is that something you're looking for, or uh, would you? Setting up on the notebook is this more focus, yeah. So I have to do this, but uh, if there's something uh, I don't know online, 
it's actually not that much work. I, I show you quickly something what I've been doing. Um, so GitHub, um, I do have a project on GitHub um, and there is a tool called uh, CDK um, that you can use and uh, all the setup that you need to do is run one command. So this is a shell command that um, in the shell script that you can run on, on Mac OS and on uh, Linux. That's why I have this tested. Um, this would uh, then download uh, roughly um, 460 megabytes of, uh, of data at first, uh, which is the CDK. It's um, a nightly built version that, I, uh, that I'm using here because I wanted to look at the latest features. And uh, then there is uh, a command, uh, uh, another script that I have set up, uh, which would then allow you to uh, install a lab environment if, if you want to do this. There is then a uh, completely set up uh, all-in-one installation um, uh, where you have, for example, a registry console with. I didn't show that yet. This is an option you can install in the cluster as well. Have a graphical interface into the registry, the internal registry, and look at that. Uh, we didn't talk about um, CloudForms, for example. CloudForms is our management uh, UI for uh, OpenShift. So um, this would uh, access the metric stack, for example, or uh, allow you to do container scans. We didn't talk about uh, software lifecycle management in a container, which would be another topic uh, that we could go into if you're interested. You can also go uh, to developers.redhat.com um, sign up there for free, um, download the CDK yourself and do this in, in a manual step um, if uh, the automated magic that I do here is, is not for you. Um, there's uh, the open source uh, variant called, called Minishift available for doing this on a notebook. There is OpenShift Online as a um, cloud service that you could uh, sign up for and you get uh, limited resources um, in, in that cloud for free um, to, to test it out. And there's test drives available with the cloud providers where you can get uh, an, uh, your own OpenShift cluster for a limited time. I think these are all that come to mind. There's some people um, don't want to use uh, another virtual machine. So MiniShift and CDK would start um, the all-in-one cluster in a virtual machine on your notebook. While there is another option that is uh, going container only and it's called OC Cluster Up. All right, I'll do this try. So, uh, first of all, the, um, um, the, uh, the command line. Yeah, uh, so this is, uh, I, I can put, put the link in, uh, in, in a mail maybe and um, send you that. But please give me feedback. I'm, I'm sure. testing this out. There's still sometimes things that, that need to be uh, improved but uh, I found that it's quite quite reliable now it takes like uh, if you're on a fast internet connection depending on the lab you choose uh, this one um, the download takes a while but uh, the OLAP command takes like five minutes and then you can uh, connect with the CDK console to your all-in-one cluster which would actually be the option to show the um, service catalog um, that I mentioned the new service catalog other questions? Uh, I want to ask two questions. Uh, the first question is about the registry. Is it something uh, that I get when I start the OpenShift? Yes, the registry is included. It's an integral, uh, in, uh, it's a part of OpenShift. Every OpenShift cluster has an integrated registry. You can even run the registry um, as, uh, as a separate enterprise registry uh, in an all-in-one cluster fashion if, if you want to. Sometimes this uh, makes sense in bigger environments. If I have my own registry already, I could use it as well. Um, you can use your own registry. It would run outside the OpenShift um, and you can then um, point OpenShift at that registry. Um, and even uh, OpenShift is capable of uh, following images in that registry itself. So if you update an image in your external registry and have your OpenShift set up in the correct way, OpenShift realizes that because it would then check every 15 minutes or so if the registry has a new image. 
Uh, my second question is about the persistent storage. Yeah. Uh, is it something I get with the cluster, or is it something I should have provided in advance outside the cluster? Mm, so for persistent um, storage, you have to provide some kind of infrastructure. You have to make a choice as uh, the one who is setting up the cluster what kind of persistent storage uh, you want to support. Um, it depends on where you have your cluster, for example, um, but also on, on the whole architecture setting. So uh, for, for service providers, uh, for example, that uh, want to run a consistent open shift um, uh, setting for all their customers in different architectures, there's uh, choices like um, cluster, for example, that is uh, architecture independent. Um, that would make sense to deploy. I mean, if I want to choose cluster FS, I need to set it this up aside. You can uh, so the cluster FS is uh, is, uh, is um, a technology that uh, has a specialty uh, to be able to run inside the OpenShift cluster as well. Uh, it's called container native storage in that case. That would be uh, you dedicate uh, three nodes of your cluster um, for uh, providing the cluster storage to the whole cluster. And then there would be three cluster pods running there uh, that that uh, span a volume across some kind of storage that is in the nodes or connected to these nodes. Um, you had a three-way copy of your uh, storage uh, this way, which makes it secure. Um, but there's also other uh, technologies available. So if you're in a, in a smaller environment and you um, don't need that robustness, you can uh, choose, for example, NFS, which is also um, architecture independent but it's not as easy to secure. Uh, what if I want to run uh, other software like um, images from the Docker registry and want to customize them via Kubernetes primitives, like a config map or something? How would I do that in OpenShift? So um, the, the challenge here is um, that most of the images uh, that are in Docker Hub are not out of the box compatible. So you would probably need to customize these to get the sources, get the Docker file, and uh, then build them in an OpenShift compatible way. F the first thing to think about is uh, that uh, they can't run as root. Um, then there is uh, things that you uh, need to think about. Some software needs to be able to resolve the user that is uh, it is running as. Um, then there's primitives that you build in into your um, your image building process to to make sure that this fits. And um, if you're at this stage that you're rebuilding the image, then you can um, also include things like uh, config uh, maps, for example, to uh, be able to provide uh, configuration from the outside. Um, you would need to include. Uh, um, a, a way to um, access the data that is configured through the config uh, map into the image. Same as uh, with the environment variables, right? So if you provide environment variables, your scripts that are run and start the application then inside the container need to um, evaluate this, this right? And is there an, uh, a Kubernetes, pure Kubernetes endpoint I could use? Or is there only the OpenShift API endpoint, which is exposed? The uh, Kuban, ah, uh, yeah. So <laughs> there's a kubectl command, but it's a link to OC. Um, you will find that uh, a lot of uh, the um, OpenShift things are, are compatible to, uh, to what you do in the Kubernetes world. There are some things that are special. Um, most of the time it's things that we developed because it was not available in Kubernetes. And uh, if you watch OpenShift for a while, you will see that we migrate to the same concepts, concepts once they become um, available or ripe enough in, in Kubernetes. So we go back to the, the upstream. We push our uh, things that are special in OpenShift um, we try to push that in, into Kubernetes as well. So we're uh, after Google, um, the second uh, ac most active contributor to Kubernetes. Thanks. Any other questions?
Hello. I have a basic question. Um, is it is Docker a hard uh, dependency because Kubernetes is basically built in mind that you can also run different container technologies? So. <laughs> Yeah, a very good question. So um, I talked about the OCI um, f um, in, in my um, presentation. And um, technological-wise, it's uh, today um, not a very hard dependency anymore. The technology is there to uh, uh, roll out OpenShift uh, with, a, um, with another um, container runtime today. It's possible, but it's not yet done and perfect. It's in development. Um, and you can expect um, alternatives to become available in the future and someday supportable in the future. But um, there is, in a supported sense, there is only the Docker that we ship. That's today uh, what there is. But if you look upstream, um, development is already going on. Um, to, to enable other runtimes. There's a CRI that you obviously talked about uh, or were thinking about, the container runtime um, interface, which was added uh, to Kubernetes uh, um, by the effort that the Chorus people did uh, mainly. They tried to integrate uh, the, the rocket runtime uh, into Kubernetes and uh, found that the Docker was quite hardwired. So they added the uh, container runtime um, interface. And this now allows uh, for, for a pluggable scenario where you could bring other container runtimes into Kubernetes clusters. And um, I imagine put still take a bit uh, before this comes to OpenShift in a supported way, but uh, I imagine it goes goes there. Yeah. Anyone else with a question? So the question is, uh, which famous customers uh, do, we, do we have? Oh, there's, there's nowadays quite a long list. Um, let me, let me quickly grab one slide because um, this uh, could illustrate that quite well. Um, so uh, there's, uh, we do have uh, lots of um, interest in this and there is um, customers we do have reference stories with. Um, and uh, these we can openly talk about. Um, the, the others, um, it's, it's not that easy to talk about. So, um, let me quickly, oh, you're seeing this already. Yeah, I've shared my screen. This is, um, is one big slide um, where we have tried to um, show a bit um, how many customers these are. Um, there is an organization called the OpenShift Commons. You might have heard about that. Um, there was KubeCon uh, last, last year here. Um, and we did uh, um, a commons gathering as well. There were over 250 people there. So these are uh, names of companies uh, that have reference stories with us. So there's documents you can read about their use case and, and so on. Um, there is a few more. So Amadeus was one of the um, bigger ones, a uh, French, uh, European customer that decided quite early on to uh, to go for OpenShift um, for their new environment. If you don't know Amadeus, uh, when you book um, flights and uh, and hotels and things, uh, your transaction most likely goes through their their systems. And they sat down and uh, dedicated developers even to to help build OpenShift uh, in a way that it makes sense for them. Um, there is. Um, yeah, there's, there's a few few others um, as well. These here um, on the on the outer fringes of the OpenShift galaxy are um, all companies that have signed up for the OpenShift Commons. So there's uh, briefings like uh, twice a week now for OpenShift topics that are broadcasted uh, and, and uh, saved to YouTube, and you can watch all the new cool things. Um, so it. Um, it's interesting. I have more slides uh, about uh, about this. If you're really interested, uh, come see me. See me afterwards. I can uh, point you to to more reference stories and talk about that more. Um, one other thing, I wanted to mention this uh, because um, it is um, quite interesting. In uh, terms of commons, there is a German organization as well. Um, it's called uh, the Anwendertreffen, OpenShift Anwendertreffen. There is uh, actually uh, next week on Monday is the next Anwendertreffen in um, 
in Frankfurt. And we do have um, over 100 people um, that we're expecting there uh, for a whole day of uh, talking about OpenShift. These meetings happen like um, three times a year. There is uh, meetups springing up um, dedicated to uh, OpenShift as well. There is um, one in Stuttgart. There is uh, one, I think, in Dortmund. Um, and uh, we're probably starting one in Berlin as well in October. So uh, thank you, Lutz Lange, for <laughs> being here. <laughs> Thank you all for attending and uh, please dig in. We have a lot of bagels and thank you so much for being here.